The, the PCS kind of inhibitors lower LPA, but they're very modest in lowering it. And there was one trial called NHCOW, which has in patients with high LPA, over 50 milligrams per deciliter, that um, uh, were treated with PCS kinase inhibitor called Repatha. And um, the, uh, the hypothesis in that trial is Repatha would lower the accumulation of fluorodeoxyglucose in the carotid arteries and the aorta of these patients. Um, unfortunately, you only had a 14% reduction in LP little a, which is very modest, uh, and the trial was negative. And I think the lesson there is that PCS canine inhibitors really are not effective in lowering LPA, and it was negative likely because it was an effective therapy for the problem they were searching for that these patients had to, to solve. So if that trial was done with an antisense oligonucleotide like in this trial, you know, we, we would be interested to see if the results would be different. So that's one trial that, that was a negative trial, uh, but I think it was the right study but with the wrong drug. Um, other than that, uh, there really isn't a lot going on in this field uh, because you need a therapeutic agent. And uh, the reason why there are not that many therapeutic agents is this protein uh, is present in very high concentration in the circulation. And it doesn't have any enzyme activity. So you can't inhibit it with a small molecule like you give a statin which inhibits an enzyme called hmg coa reductase. So smaller molecules are not going to treat LP little a from that perspective. So the only other possibility is to use antibodies. And uh, PCS kinase antibodies don't address LPA directly, but if you made an LPA antibody to bind the LPA, you would have to give probably grams of it a week because there's so much LPA in the circulation. So you can't make a viable therapy by using an antibody. And the reason why this trial is so important is it's taken advantage of a brand new technology called RNA therapeutics. And what, what that does is you have DNA that makes RNA that makes protein. And right now we're dealing at the protein level with a lot of our drugs. But this technology now works inside the cell to prevent the mRNA from making protein. So it's a very elegant method to shut down the factory that makes a protein the body has too much of. So instead of like making it and then finding an antibody to bind it and have to clear all those immune complexes, you just shut down the cells in the, in the liver from making that specific protein. There are six RNA therapeutics approved right now. So it's very early in the technology. And this is a good example of using a technology to treat a drug, to, to make a drug for a target that was prior was felt to be undruggable. And so this really reflects the power of antisense and RNA therapeutics to give a therapy for something that up to this point we really couldn't find any way to treat. Well, the current uh, state of care is they just get usual preventative therapies for cardiovascular disease. So they're usually on aspirin. If they have stents, they're on Plavix or a, a, you know, an antiplatelet agent on top of that. Uh, they get cholesterol lowering therapies, but, but LDL is a very separate lipoprotein than LPA. They don't go in the same direction. Now, statins are used to lower LDL, but statins tend to be neutral or LPA raising. So even though we use statins for all these patients, it doesn't really help their LPA risk factor. And of course, they usually get the usual secondary prevention, you know, if, if they have diabetes or hypertension or renal disease, you know, they'll have ACE inhibitors and um, other, other drugs in that pathway. But there really is nothing right now to offer them except apheresis. And apheresis is done very commonly in Germany, where there's about 2,000 patients on it. But in the U.S. is done ad hoc and not approved in the U.S. So there could be only about 50 patients in the U.S. undergoing apheresis for this disorder, despite the massive number of patients with it. So it's underutilized. And I think what we really need is a specific therapy for lowering the LPA, because what we have now addresses all the other issues, you know, the hypertension, the LDL, uh, the diabetes, but there is no therapy for LPA that's pharmacological, that's effective and can be used with the potency that this drug Just has. Make, make it clear to physicians that this is a bona fide risk factor, has a very strong genetic component. The patients with family histories that are young are particularly prone to getting LPA-mediated disease. And I would like to see both physicians check their own levels, just like they know their LDLs, and also do it in their patients because they'll find a lot of people that they previously didn't know had LPA-driven disease. And along with that, uh, raising the awareness is, is very important. And in fact, the uh, recent guidelines, the cholesterol guidelines, now include LPA as a test to check when you're not sure what to do with a patient. If sort of, they're sort of kind of in the middle, you're not sure 
you know, what's going on with them or what's driving their disease. Now at least we have some guidelines to tell us we can check an LPA level. So I, I would like to make sure that this uh, is, you know, well uh, uh, appreciated by the general community. And it really will set the stage for testing the LPA hypothesis, which has never been tested before, which is if you have high LPA levels and you lower them, do the patients do better? That, so this trial will basically allow us, or gives us the rationale to feel confident that the hypothesis will be tested and most likely be proven accurate, that we can further improve cardiovascular risk by lowering LPA in those people whose levels are elevated.